Okay, so you touched on the French accent, so we're going to have to ask you to speak <laughs> one or two lines of French just for the sake of it. So give us your, uh, let's just say, tell us something about this podcast in French and we'll go away and listen to it. <laughs> ouais, bonjour, aujourd'hui, on, on est ici en train de faire euh, un petit interview avec euh, Sofiane. Et ben, je crois que ça, ça va partir en Instagram. Welcome to HQ for Windmill Boxing Team. I'm the head coach. This is the first episode of the Punchline podcast. And today we've got a special guest, Janaid Shaheen. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sofiane. So we're going to start off right from the beginning. Tell us about your childhood. Um, well, I was born in Belgium, Brussels. Um, just a normal childhood, really. Uh, but it was a bit different because uh, I was one of the few Pakistanis in Brussels uh, back then. Uh, don't ask my age. <laughs> so when you say uh, you were the, one of the few Pakistanis in Brussels, what was the general makeup of equality, uh, diversity, sort of, on the floor? So uh, majority, uh, there were Moroccans, Algerians, Turkish, uh, and you'll see very few Pakistanis there. Uh, I think my dad was one of the few first Pakistanis to get to Brussels. Uh, he moved when he was uh, 12 or 13 or something. So why Brussels? What do you remember? Why did your dad came to Brussels? And um, he, he, well, his story was um, he hated education and uh, he just wanted to move out of Pakistan. He wanted to go out of Pakistan to Brussels because uh, he wanted a better life. So he came to the UK first uh, for literally three, four hours. He got the, the, the stamp to go ahead, but he said, no, I want to go to Brussels. And then that's why then he moved to Brussels. Um, then started working in factories, uh, hotels, cleaning, everything. You name it. And then there you go. From there, he just, mashallah, he did really well. So going back uh, to, to Brussels, you, did you go to school in Brussels? I did. I, I did. Well, I was in only male school. And uh, I did uh, my first, up to year six there. Um, and then... Obviously, first uh, seven, year eight here. Over there, it's totally different, like in French. But yes, it was different because back then, uh, my childhood was, I was really skinny and small. So I used to do uh, other people's homework and stuff because I used to get bullied. And I, I still remember, um, it was a PE class and uh, they used to pick on me and stuff. And one day, I just couldn't be bothered to do their homework. So they took me around the corner, they beat me up, and they literally, yeah, I think I was in year two, and the year six people, uh, they came to me, beat me up, and pissed on me. Literally pissed on me. Well, the Moroccans, aren't they? But yeah, it, it, it has that effect sometimes. But I think about it, I say, why would they do that? But pff, it is what it is, isn't it? So after that, what, when you came to the UK, what happened in the UK? Oh, in the UK, it was even worse. <laughs> So you was a new kid. I was a new country. kid. I had I had no language skills. I had I didn't know English whatsoever. Um, even here, I used to get bullied. And say, oh, you're you're Pakistani. You're Asian. Why are you pretending to be French? And I was like, well, because I speak French. I don't know any English. Uh, but yeah, but then I think I got stronger because I moved here alone. I was in a host uh, hostels, accommodation alone, and you just gotta survive there. <laughs> So when you, when you say you were alone, what was your living uh, accommodation like and who was you living with and why was you alone? Um, I moved here. I went to Hijaz College uh, to do one year of Islamic studies. And uh, from there, I carried on my cricket as well. Uh, but yeah, majority, most of them were all uh, Muslims, but from different ethnic ethnicity. So from the school... Um, what were your favorite subjects and how did you adopt the career path? We'll go to your career path in a moment. But what were your subjects? What was your aim as a young Janaid? You know, I always wanted to be a um, cricketer or a racer. But as you know, Asians, oh no, you cannot be a cricketer. What's that? There's no future, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but I still carried on. Uh, but I think in terms of subjects, uh, maths was my favorite. I've always been very strong in maths. I think it's because of my dad. 
And when you say about cricket, can you tell us what made you interested in cricket? Do you like playing it? Did you have a role model? What levels you played at? Yeah, uh, so in Belgium, uh, we all used to play, all the Pakistani community used to play in the parks and stuff, uh, just with table, table matches. And then uh, slowly I started going to the only British school in Brussels. And when I started playing there, they said, you know what, Janay, you're good enough to play a better league, a better level of cricket. I, I didn't think of anything of it. Um, my parents didn't think anything of it. But when I moved here and they said, you know, you're actually good. You know, you should, you should uh, concentrate more on cricket. Uh, mom and dad said no. <laughs> uh, just focus on your studies, which is fair enough, you know. Um, but when I moved to Birmingham, I uh, started playing school cricket. And then I, I won the, the Docker Shield Cup. Um, and then from there, I got uh, the trial for Warwickshire. And then it was something different. Then my dad was like, okay, Janet, you know what, go for it. <laughs> so looking back at that time, were you like one of the few Asian people that was part of cricket in Warwickshire or was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it was very, um, I wouldn't say diverse at all. Um, I think it was me and two more Asians. Um, but yeah, even when it comes, when it comes to like trials and stuff, um, I didn't see many Asians in trials. So were there barriers with that? Talk about some of the barriers that you faced in actual selection. The selection, um, right. You know, when it comes to cricket, Sufyan, when I went for my trials, uh, my first trial was wicked. It was indoor training and, um, all you got to do is ball nets, bat and bats and stuff. And I was swinging left, right, centre. And I think you know me from back then. Anyway. Swing bowler, was, so you're a bowler, yeah? Yeah, left arm. And I used to swing miles and this. Even the, the coach were like, okay, you know, he's good. But they couldn't say anything yet because I was getting all the, the seniors out. <laughs> okay. Uh, then obviously I got a letter saying, yes, you've passed your first stage, second stage. I said, okay, cool, second stage. I went on second stage and uh, again, same thing. Fitness was perfect. I started bowling, batting. But then I got a letter saying, um, you know, you haven't, you've been unsuccessful. Okay. But we can't ask them. Why? Because, and that's what hit me the most. Because no I knew, I knew I was one of the best there. And you know, when you, when you, I don't know, when your self-confidence is that high, and when you know you're good, you know you can do this. But then the other party says, no, sorry, mate. And they do not give any feedback, no reasons. It messes up with your mind a lot. So you think you got let down by the system, yeah? Yeah. And there was no feedback, mm -hmm. no transparency. So going back a step, the start of your career, we've obviously touched on your, your left arm bowler, <laughs> which I know a little bit about cricket. It's, it's quite a rare phenomenon to have a left yeah. arm quick in the team. So tell us about the top speed. Uh, my top speed, uh, I, I think you remember when Shreya Bhattar came in at Jabastin, he did a competition pace, peaceful pace or something. Yeah, peaceful like peace. a speed gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He came and uh, my, uh, well, my granddad was alive back then. He took me there and he said, you know, come on, let's see. And he saw my bowling and not just the line and length, even my speed was pretty phenomenal. He so got, just got numbers, MPH? 90.2 miles. Quickest one? That was the quickest, yeah. Cool. Average, I was 81, 82. So pretty quick, basically. Back then, yeah, yeah, not anymore. And you mentioned your granddad. <laughs> tell us about your family. Look, tell us uh, the build up, the structure. Who's who's the don in the house, and where you fit in? Um, well, I got four sisters. Um, my elder sister, she's uh, she's in Chicago. She's a doctor. My uh, next sister, she's a chemical engineer. She's in London. The third sister, she's in Dubai. She is an international relations and business. And then it's me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then my little sister, she's a graphic designer, illustrator. So in the house, you've got a lot, a lot of talent, basically. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody doing um, something yeah, different. Parents always pushed us to do, you know, education and then pursue everything ahead. So you mentioned everybody's careers. Now we're going to move on to your career path. So I want you to tell us your first job. Your, what's your first job ever? We're not going to go to your career yet. Yeah. What was your first job? My first job when I was uh, 12 years old. And my dad took me to his friend's place in a factory in Brussels. And, and that was for like three weeks. And he goes, Jaleed, I want you to work here. And it was a retail clothing factory, um, wholesale mainly. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was just um, 
packaging, selling, um, you know, merchandising. And I was only 12. It was a good job. It was different. <laughs> it was different. It was I a good choose, manager. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, my dad's uh, friend, yeah, he was, he was wicked. He's amazing. Uncle Said, I still remember. So if you could go back now and that company was still blooming, what, what advice would you give them? Like, I say, hire me, let me model for your clothes. <laughs> so now we've just touched on your career. So if you want to tell us the next step now, how you got to, before your career, how you went towards heading to that career. Okay, so when I was uh, where, well studying at uni, I started doing little jobs like pizza, um, delivery jobs, um, anything that will come up, uh, student ambassador. Um, and then from there, I started working up, uh, started uh, modeling. I got approached uh, because when I w- used to travel from Nuneaton to Brussels every long weekend, every third weekend, um, I remember uh, I got approached uh, because, uh, you know, in Europe, they like uh, skinny people. But yeah, they like skinny and young people to model. And I thought, okay, yeah, no problem. They gave me a card. I said, no, I'm not interested because I had no idea. Obviously, firstly, the only thing I was thinking was that if mom and dad finds out, oi, <laughs> I'm dead. <laughs> so I didn't think anything of it, really. Um, but yeah, when I, when I went to uni, started working these little jobs um, and then call center jobs, standard, normal, you know, not, nothing fancy. Uh, but then uh, um, I got approached again for modeling. And I thought, you know what, let me give it a go. Let's see. Let's see. What's the harm in that? I mean, it's only a catwalk, <laughs> you know. Um, so I did that. And then the next thing I see, uh, one of my good friend, uh, Ziggy, Ziggy Akta, he's a designer, Shivani designer. He goes to me, oh, Junaid, by the way, I've put you through to uh, Asiana most eligible bachelor thing, competition thing. I said, you what? What is that thing? I don't even know, firstly. And um, he was like, oh, don't worry about it. It's just a competition. I said, yeah, whatever. I didn't think anything of it. <laughs> and then people started voting. I think from 500, it went 200, then to 50, 20, and 10. And then the next thing I see is um, get an email, get a call uh, saying, Junaid, Shaheen. I said, yes. Um, I was a crime mediator back then. Um, uh, you've been... Uh, You've been nominated in the top 10. I say, like, what top 10? I don't even know. It was that long. I think it was like a month or two. And it was just a brief talk anyway with Ziggy. Um, and then they told me everything about it. And he goes, oh, okay. So what happens now? And I said, oh yeah, you got to come to London. I said, London? I don't have a car. <laughs> what do you want to do? He's like, no, you do want to come to London. I said, okay, I'll treat. I'll see. Um, and then uh, they told me it's going to be a, a competition. Um, question answers with judges panels and I said okay and in, the, in those panels they were like celebrities top 10 and even in in the guys like they were all like singers and I don't even know what, like they were big people and then, then there's me the, the tiny little guy I was like oh hello <laughs> um, and that's it really I think in in that moment uh, yeah they started asking questions and uh, I think the judges were like are you really French? Your English is really good for someone to speak French, fluent French. I was like, yeah, I mean, I have to. Um, I think one of the things that I do is act. I'm always, I've always been acting in my life. Um, my English hasn't been good ever. Um, but because I got bullied so much, I know how to act. Do you get it? So I know to hide my French accent and put that so then people don't think I'm faking it or whatever, you know, so. Okay, so you touched on a French accent, so we're going to have to ask you to speak <laughs> one or two lines of French just for the sake of it. So give us your, uh, let's just say, tell us something about this podcast in French and we'll go away and listen to it. <laughs> ouais, bonjour, aujourd'hui, ouais, on, sait, on est ici en train de faire euh, un petit interview avec euh, Sofiane. Et ben, je crois qu'il va, ça, ça va partir en Instagram. Peut-être 
I'm just going to stop you there because I don't know what you're talking about. It sounds good. I just asked you, would that go on Instagram? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you said. We're not working out what you said. I'll think about it. Right, cool. put that. So, so going back to the modeling career, you said that you were pushed forward by a certain individual. So would you say that in life, uh, sometimes it does take that extra push from, uh, let's say a motivator or somebody who's like a pioneer in this field or somebody just there to mentor you? Or is it just, you think it was pure chance? I, I really think to have a mentor or to have a role model in life, uh, it's vital. Uh, I mean, as, for, as Ziggy, as I said, like we're very good friends. I mean, you know, all has respected him. He respects me. But, but for him to do that for me, I mean, I don't even, I don't even know. I don't even ask. But that gesture was, was really, really, really good. Like it boosted my confidence. You know, going back to the bit where you said you had a bit of a negative experience in, in your childhood and when you first came to England and it's because you were different. Do you think that because of that, you didn't recognize your own potential and it took somebody like Ziggy to say, yo, you've got potential? Yeah, I would say that because where I was in life, I think I was, uh, I didn't believe in myself, I'd say. Uh, but sometimes, you know, I put, it's, it's not hard to be nice to people. You know, or just one smile can change someone's day. Um, but yeah, I would say, yeah, yeah, 100%. Okay, so now I'm going to turn the tables around, yeah? If you were looking back and you saw somebody, a young Junaid Shaheen, getting bullied in the playground, what would be your advice to that person? Firstly, I would say do not be, do not shy, do not shy away from the truth. And don't keep everything inside you because that's what I was doing. And I think I still do that because it became part of my personality. I've never shared my problems, my issue with anyone. And I think that's one of the most scary thing you can do for yourself. That if you do not share anything with anybody, it could be anybody, honestly. It could be anybody. It doesn't have to be your family or your friend. It could be anybody. But it's very um, important. I think if my past wasn't like that, I wouldn't become the way I am now. You know, every person, every human, whether it's a woman or a man, they, they, they're full of emotions. But for someone to say, they're emotionless. It's it's uh, scary because they don't feel anything. I think I don't feel any pain as such. Um, when someone hurt me, like mentally, physically, anything, I just don't react or I don't stop them. I just like to see how far will they go. It's 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 a, it's part of my personality now, which is bad. I know this. I know it's bad, but. I've become like that. Why have I become like that? It's because I haven't shared my, what, was, what I was going through in the past. You know, my dad was busy, um, you know, making a living for us, all of us. Mom, with, help with mom as well. Um, I've got four sisters, I've got no brother. And that maybe that is a big thing. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, I've never had friends. Never. Um, because I think I've always had that trust issues. Um, that's why I've always kept my distance with everyone. I mean, whatever people see on my social media, uh, they always say, they always ask me, oh, Janae, what? how come you're always happy? But that's what I like to show people. I mean, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, it's all fake. <laughs> you know, whatever I show you, I show you. I want to. Because I know there's someone out there looking at me that probably thinking, oh, I would like to be like him, you know? But then what message am I showing to that person? That's how I think now. So going back to, you said, touched on a bit about you never had a brother. In my situation, whenever I need advice, I go to my sisters because sometimes my brothers just give me useless advice <laughs> and I'm wise enough to know it's useless advice. Would you say in your life, your rock has been your sisters or would you say it's somebody else? I know you said you haven't got many friends, but... You also mentioned your sister specifically. So is that one of your sisters, your rock or the group of sisters? Um, Who did you actually go to in the end to get some of this out? 
No one. So you still at the start? No one. But it's been uh, three, four years now that uh, been uh, very uh, close to my sister, uh, the one in Dubai, okay. Kieran. She's she's uh, she's like my brother, I guess. <laughs> the rock, basically. Yeah, the family. yeah. She's she's amazing. I mean, we've always been close to each other, but for me to open up myself, I think um, she was the first one. Like three years ago, I started opening up little by little because um, I was, I think, going crazy. <laughs> so I had to, I had to, because I think, I think I was, I was more scared that if something happens, nobody will know what I was going through. That's what I had to tell my sister, Kieran. Okay, so obviously it's, it's a negative experience, but I tr- truly believe there's always a positive that comes out of oh, a negative. Oh, 100%, yes. Yeah? So now, putting uh, sort of your experience at the forefront, what advice would you give to a young person who's probably going to watch this program or listen to this program and is going through a similar issue? What's the one thing you would expect them or tell them that would help really help them in that situation early on? I would say open up. Talk. Talking is so important. It is probably the most important skill you can learn in life. Um, I didn't, and I regret that. You know, I regret that now. But talking, what I mean by talking is you need you need someone, at least one person, just one person, or even if you, okay, even if you can't, then please at least write it somewhere. You know, writing can may help a lot, uh, you know, within your, w- what's going through you in your mind. Uh, yeah, that's, that's all I'll say. It, I mean, talking and communication is um, the most important thing. So, okay, now we're going to, move on a little bit to your career so you told us how it started so from that point onwards what did you do how did you grow yourself did you work for people I didn't stop I didn't stop I said you know what okay okay wait <laughs> mom and dad if they if they see this podcast they're gonna kill me but listen, listen who cares listen, never mind it's done now mom and dad <laughs> um, I started modeling you know photo shoots catwalks, traveling, um, and I used to lie to mom and dad. You know, I said, oh, I got this work, I got that work going on with companies. And they said, yeah, that's fine. But I've never, I was never allowed to stay a night out anywhere, ever, whether it's for my sisters or me, we've never been, we've been brought up like that. You know, never stay late. You know, before Maghrib, just come back home. Um, but we used to try that. I, I said, look, I can't, it's, if it's a catwalk, of course it's going to start later on, like six, seven, eight o'clock. <laughs> and um, yeah, so slowly, slowly started building, started building my portfolio, started doing catwalks, um, started getting recognition. So I, it was just a weird feeling when I used to go, like, for example, Bullring in town, people used to come to me and say, oh, you're Janae Shaheen. And I said, yeah. Oh, we've seen you in this. I said, okay, can you take a picture? I was like, Huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> Me? <laughs> so yeah, that was a, it was a good feeling, you know, to be recognized. You're just walking outside. It is a good feeling. Uh, but then I think the way I got caught was, uh, is different. Uh, I think uh, it was one of the, uh, no, first my dad was in Pakistan and uh, he saw a billboard. And you was on that. And I was on that. <laughs> <laughs> Discreet. Yeah, oh well. He took a picture and then he said to me, say, Janet, is that you? I was like, huh? No. No, that's not me. Then he came back. He said, Janet, tell me, tell me the truth. I won't say anything. I said, yeah, dad. And he batted me. <laughs> but bear in mind, I was like 23, 24, probably. And he, yeah, he's like, Janet, don't do that. What are you going to do with your life? What are you, what are you doing? There's no future, blah, blah, blah. You know, normal parent talk. Uh, I said, uh, yeah, but dad, I'm not doing anything wrong. I just do a catwalk. I don't even stay out in the after parties. I don't like this thing. I just like to walk, come back, get changed, go. It's just, you know, that feeling, that literally 10 second feeling on the ramp when 
everyone just watching, yes, people say you lack a walking hanger. But, you know, when you walk in, you have like all these cameras in front of you and you have all these audience around you. It is, that feeling is mad. The buzz. It is mad. Okay, so touching on the catwalk, what's the best outfit you've ever wore? Explain it to us. Uh, I've always worn um, like Shervanis and suits and stuff, um, jeans. Um, I've always maintained myself in that sense. <laughs> um, I think best outfits. When I walked for, I walked for Vivian Westwood, Alexander McQueen uh, in London. And I think that was one of the best experience because there was so, like, you know, you had every model had a, had a coordinator backstage to, to change you, to tell you what to do. And it was just amazing. I mean, I mainly do, uh, used to do catwalks and shoots for like Asian, uh, in, in, the, in the Asian industries. But yeah, to do Western, it's different. So um, the actual catwalk, who's, who's the most famous person that's ever paid you a compliment or took a picture or said they liked the outfit? When I walk um, on the catwalk, the designer, when the designer comes to you and says, you know what, can I take a picture with you or a selfie with you? Uh, that is the biggest compliment because if I can put their clothes out and they like their clothes on me, I think that's the biggest compliment. So you feel like you've done them justice? Yeah, 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 100%. Because I, I think I was one of these, those models that I never used to walk straight. Like I always used to do something on the catwalk. You know, normally it's just a one straight walk, but they knew what they're getting into. <laughs> when they hire me, they say, okay, Jeanette, just, just be yourself. Don't worry about it. So I used to go in the middle because I, I used to live the actual outfit. So for example, once uh, I remember it was in, uh, I think Manchester. Yeah, Manchester. I can't remember the designer, but they had a very long Shirvani, but heavy long Shirvani. And it's very like a Sufi, Dervish type. And I said, don't worry, I got this. <laughs> so, and I think they had like a Sufi music background and that even that boosted me up. I said, yes, I'm going to do this. And I started just walking in the middle, just start spinning like a derivation and everything. And then everyone, the whole audience went mad. I said, yes, I got this. <laughs> yeah, I came back. The designer was like, you're something. I said, thanks. <laughs> like the wild card. <laughs> yeah. Rule breaker. Yeah. The, the, um, I think uh, then from there onwards, uh, the designers, uh, I had I created my name in the industry. I generated the guy who can do crazy stuff on the catwalk. So, okay, now we're going to inspire some youngsters, yeah? Young people watching this podcast, let's say between 16, 27, look quite pretty or handsome and want to become a model. What advice would you give them? Ooh, um, I would say first... You know, in this industry, looks is not always everything. You got to have the connections. You got to know people. Uh, yes, you got to have the height and all that. But they know you now, so. <laughs> yeah, they know me. Uh, but yeah, I've, I think I've, in the past, I've helped uh, enough people. And I've all, I'm, I'm always helping people. Whoever messages me, um, you know, I'm always guiding them and telling them how you can go about it. Um, yes, you got to create your own portfolio. Uh, and then you get it yourself out there. Uh, it's like you are your product. You got to sell yourself, basically. But how would you do that? By collaborating first, I think first year probably, you got to work for free. Or, you know, half the price that other people are working. Because they've got the name, they've got a portfolio, they can charge whatever they want. But you're a newcomer. How would you get into the industry? You know, you got to build up your portfolio and slowly, slowly get it out there. Go to audition casting. And don't, you know, majority of time, they will say no to you. Don't be disheartened. Don't give up. That's the one thing I'll say. Do not give up because people out there, they've already decided who they want. They just want to do that for show, you know, to get a buzz out of it. But don't give up, especially in castings. Uh, it's, it's pretty difficult these days. Let's say somebody young has got the talent and they get picked and they're going for their first, like, let's say, major event where they're going to be recognised, what would they do to wear the crown? Like you said yourself, you would do the things that they didn't expect. you break the rules. 
you had charisma. What would you expect people to do? The main thing is your personality. You got to bring your personality out. You got to be out there. So what is personality on a catwalk? Explain to us. Oh God, you got to talk through your eyes. That's one of the skills that I've learned. I, I had no idea you can do that, you know. So what can do you mean? Be, you can talk through your eyes. Do you mean eye contact? Yeah, eye contact, but like squint, but maybe, or just looking, looking at someone specific for long enough so that they're uncomfortable. But you, but everyone knows that you are the center of attention. But it's just, it's just a game, basically. Catwalk is a game. Honestly, it, when you walk, you've got to walk straight and then come back. You know, walk straight, pause for like four seconds on the top and then come back, right? But when you're there, that four seconds for you should be life-changing. Because that, that spot right at the front, this is where all the pictures I've taken. All the photographers out there. But before that, when you're walking, everyone's eyes on you, your feet. And they, probably most of the people, they're probably thinking, you know what, he's going to trip or she's going to trip. They're going to fall. What are you going to do if you fall? Don't think like that. If you think you're going to fall, you will fall. Just walk casually, just walk normal and have that confidence within yourself that, you know what, you, you are the best in those four seconds. When you're walking down, that's, that feeling, I can't, I can't explain. It's just, it's just amazing. Especially, you know, when I first started doing catwalk, nobody knew me. I didn't know what to expect. Um, and then they had, you had, you got choreography. So, you know, sometimes you've got to do a zigzag walk. You know, you've got to stop in every station. You've got to wait and you've got to wait for the other model to come in front of you, you know, things like that. So yeah, learning the choreography is important as well. Uh, but then again, that's the creative director side. Um, but you as a model, you need to learn all this. So basically you got five seconds to give him the death stare. Oh yes. To the cameras. Yeah. If you want a good picture. Hell yeah. <laughs> okay. So now we're just going to go into some quick details. So I'm going to ask you a question and you're going to be getting quick answers. Yeah. I can't think. There's no thinking needed oh, for these questions. Yeah. Okay. So favorite color? Black. Favorite brand? I don't have any. <laughs> favorite watch? Uh, Oh, what the one I'm wearing what is it Patek Philippe okay best place to travel to for a holiday oh uh, Fiji Island so what's the hardest part of being a parent or oh, is it loads of uh, loads where of do things? I start from <laughs> hardest part of being, no nothing is hard nothing is hard honestly if you're thinking of becoming a parent don't think because there's no right or wrong way you know, people, I know so many people, like so many guys messages me and say, they always say to me, Janet, how come you're so calm? What do you do, you know, with your kids? Because obviously on my social media and stuff. Um, and they say, I, I always have to say that, guys, look, life does not come with a manual. You got to learn. It's like you got to learn on the job. I, in a, I never thought in a million years I would be changing nappies. You know, um, Everyone was saying, everyone would ask me, oh, what would you like, daughter or a son? I said, no, I always wanted a daughter. Um, I think uh, because of what I've seen in life or what I've, uh, what I've been through, and I always wanted a daughter because I think I'll, I wanted to create a model within, like I wanted me in a female version basically but better because I am no I'm like here and my daughter's already up there <laughs> you know mashallah she is she is amazing uh, that's why I think I, I bought her here once for the boxing <laughs> yeah it was amazing best feeling in the world obviously you're a family man and tell us about it when did you get married how did it happen oh. what was the wedding like obviously a a buzzing model with the wedding, you must have had a good outfit on. Yeah, it was Ziggy's <laughs> Sharani. Talk us through it. Um, so I met my wife. Where did I meet my wife? Yes, so Don't I say was... that on camera. She'll kill you. You no. have to remember these things. <laughs> no, <laughs> I had to think hard. So I met my wife. Um, I was shooting, I was in a music video. And she was coming to drop her friend off. Um, so she actually yeah, dropped her friend off and that's it. 
And then the, I think the following week, we had a get together of that music video and then everyone got together, just started talking casually, you know, and then didn't think anything of it. And that's it, stopped there. Uh, I think a year later, a year and a half later, something like that, I can't remember. Um, I just messaged her, I said, hey, how are you, long time? And she was like, oh my God, why are you messaging me? I was like, huh? What do you mean? I just asked you how you are. And she goes, yeah, but how come you got time for me? You know? I said, uh, uh, what do you mean? I'm still a normal guy. I'm asking you how you are. You know, nothing else. <laughs> she goes, uh, sorry, I'm not interested. I said, I haven't asked you out. I just asked you how you are. <laughs> and she goes, uh, yeah, I'm fine. But why are you messaging me? And she kept on doing that. And I said, wow, that's just, that's amazing, you know? Um, I said, um, nothing. I was just wondering if you're okay, if you want to grab a coffee or whatever. It's been a long time. We haven't talked or spoken to each other. And she goes, <laughs> she goes, you're always surrounded with, with women in catwalks and fashion shoots and stuff. Um, why do you want to meet me? I was like, no, I don't want to meet you. I'm just saying, you know, nothing harm. <laughs> like there's no harm in it. Um, and she goes, no, I'm not that type of girl. Sorry. Goodbye. Beep. I said, okay, wicked. <laughs> I called her again the next day. <laughs> and I said to her, can I have your mom's number? Honestly, that's all I said. I didn't think, I didn't talk to her. I personally didn't know what I was thinking. It was like that. Because that night, I thought to myself, I've got a job. I've got a house, I've got a car. Alhamdulillah, I've got everything. I've done everything in life. What's next? You know? And then I was thinking about her. I said, for a girl to say this, she, uh, for me, her, my, my respect for her went from there to woof, up there, you know? Uh, then... Uh, she said, she asked me, why do you want my mom's number? I said, uh, because I want to ask you first, are you single? And she goes, yes. And I said, okay, I don't know you. You don't know me. But I think we've got the whole life in front of us. We can get to know each other. But properly. Um, she put the phone down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that... Oh, that made me so angry. <laughs> you but, was actually trying here. Yeah, yeah. At that you, time, I was, I was, I was trying. Okay. I was fully trying. Um, and then uh, she was like, "Janae, this is not a joke." I called her again. So she goes, "Janae, this is not a joke." I said, "Look, I don't know what I'm doing, but I just want to speak. To, I don't want to speak to you. I want to speak to your mum, your dad." That's not really charming. I don't want to speak to you. <laughs> no, because she wasn't. She she wasn't listening to me. She wasn't talking to me. And uh, and she goes. Uh, I'll see. So the next day, next morning, um, my dad was in Brussels yeah, for work stuff. I told my mom. And she goes, how long you've known her for? And I said, mm, two days, one day. And she was like, are you sure, Junaid? You know mothers are, they have always with you. <laughs> they, whatever you're going to do, you can never do anything bad. <laughs> you know, uh, but yeah, mom said, are you sure, Janelle? I said, mm, yeah, I am. No, I'm not. <laughs> uh, she goes, uh, look, you need to be certain about this. You need to be 100%. I said, mom, look, I don't know what I'm doing, but I think this would be probably the best decision in my life. And uh, she goes, it is your life. You know, you got to choose your partner. So just wait for dad. I said, okay. Dad was coming in uh, the next seven days or so. So within those next seven days, I arranged a meeting with her mom. So, I met her mom. And she was like, uh, she looked at me. She goes, you're six foot. <laughs> She's five foot one. Why my daughter? <laughs> no. Put you on the spot, please. Yeah. And I said, I, I said to her straight away, I said, I don't know. Honestly, auntie, I don't know. 
But if I ask you this question, what if you choose someone for her and that doesn't go the way you wanted, what would you do then? You know, marriage, it's, I've always classed as gambling. You never know what you're going to get. Even if you know someone for the past five, 10 years, living with someone is totally different, you know, than seeing someone. And she goes, she goes to me in Punjabi. <laughs> she knew you a philosopher. I said, no, auntie, I'm just telling the truth. Nothing else. Uh, and then she's like, okay. And then obviously we had a, a good talk about life and stuff. And she goes, look, Junaid, I like you so far. And I said, okay. But my husband would not like you. Okay. I was like, yo, hold up. <laughs> Why? <laughs> she goes, my husband is chachi. And I was like, and? And you're a model. <laughs> it doesn't go. <laughs> but at that time, I was not only just doing modeling. I was a crime mediator. And I, but even then I said, but auntie, leave that for him to decide, you know? And let me just speak to him. Let me meet. You know, I don't even know if my dad going to say yes. But I think if we, if we be positive in life, we can, we can make this happen. And she was like, um, okay, we'll see. That's it. And then, uh, yeah, it was, it was hard. It was difficult. Uh, my wife's dad was uh, very much into education. He's always been into education, which is good, very good. But uh, obviously my wife at that time was studying. So she got married to me the second year of uni. So there was one more year left. Uh, it, was, it was hard, very, very hard. There you go. Eight years on now. Two kids, mashallah. No problems, man. No problem. All good. But come on. If and whoever says to you, marriage is beautiful and marriage has always been highs and no lows, they're lying to you. They're not telling the truth. No. No. There's no way your life can be 100% every day, all the time. There's no way. You know, sometimes you wake up and you feel moody. You don't need a reason. You know, sometimes there's a lot of things, that little, little things that can matter the most to the other person, but you don't know, but you're still learning. It's like, again, as I said, it's learning on the job, isn't it? You don't know, there's no manual. So many, so many messages that I get say, how, why, how do you keep that spark up in life? You know, how do you keep so much positivity in life? You know, your, your Snapchat, your Instagram, it's so full of life, so good, blah, blah. I said, why? Well, because that's what I show you. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to show you, uh, you know, my, I'm sh me shouting at my kids, for example, even though I don't or whatever, <laughs> you know. You just slipped up there. <laughs> no. no, no. Uh, <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is only you know what's good for you and your family. Only you know because you're a man, you're the provider of the house only you should know that how how is what's good and what's bad for your family you know so like there's, there might be another family might say oh yes you can go out late or you can stay wherever you want we don't care that's fine you know that's their life but me as a person the way i've been built the way i've been brought up we have values we have discipline I think these two things I, I'm teaching my kids and they're absolutely amazing. Honestly, like my son, he's four years old, mashallah. He can read everything. I don't even know where he get that from. He's so sharp. So, so sharp. Like I get called from his nursery. So we haven't seen a kid like this. He can read everything. You touched on discipline. So obviously from a coaching point of view, that's really important. And you put into... Uh an abstract of life. So talk about discipline for yourself. What was your discipline to stop you going off the tracks? And what sort of disciplines do you put into your kids to stop them sort of coming off the path you want them to go on? I think my discipline, I, I'm still scared. I'm, st I'm still scared of my dad. You know, I cannot look into his eyes. I'm 33 years old. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's good and it's bad. I'll say it's good because it kept me on my track. Like, 
I could have done, I know so many people, honestly, Sufyan, there's about, I think 90% of people, if, for example, if you become a model, you'll go off track. You, you will start doing some crazy stuff. I've seen it with my own eyes. But honestly, touch wood, <laughs> I've, I used to work and come home. That's it. No messing around. No nothing whatsoever. For me, it was just a job. You do your thing, you get paid, you go home. That's it. Don't stay there after. No after parties, never. Nothing like that. Because in my head, I was thinking what my dad will be thinking. You know? What my mom will be thinking. So when you start living like this, I think, I don't think this is classed as uh, scared. Uh, I think it's more like respect. More of a conscience. Yeah. yeah. Not to let people down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Okay, so we're going to go on to the next stage now. So the next stage is, tell us what you do now and how you go about it, what you enjoy about doing now. Yeah, so I am... Uh, I'm AML specialist, anti-money laundering. Anti-money laundering? Yeah. Why did you look at me like that when you said that? <laughs> Listen, if you want to talk about it, we can talk about it off the camera. <laughs> yeah, by the way, I've got no money. I don't launder no money, just for the record. <laughs> no, so what does that job involve and tell us how you do it? Um, so I am um, I'm self-employed. So you're self-employed. What does that mean? For those young people out there who are looking for a job, they want to work for Snoop Dogg or they want to work for Mayweather Camp or yeah. they want to work for somebody. What does self-employed mean? Self-employed means you are your own boss. Yeah? And you make, whatever money you make, you keep it. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> obviously, you got to pay your taxes and stuff. Uh, but what I mean by that is um, I've done my qualifications in anti-money laundering and I become a contractor in financial services. So I get contracts with banks, financial institutions. Uh, they say to me, Junaid, it's three months, six months, 12 months contract. Uh, this is the role. This is the job. Uh, we've got this many cases. Sort it out. And then I go there and work my way through the cases. Um, and they pay me per day. So it's, whether it's a day rate contract or monthly contract or whatever. So right when you said that particular piece that you get the contract and you go there and you sort the mess out, I just had a vivid thought there of a movie I watched called The Accountant. And this guy, his day job is an accountant, but his real job is he's a hitman. No way. <laughs> so when he goes to clean the mess up, is that <laughs> what we're getting at here? We no, just, no, no, okay. no, no. Well, I just want to clarify I do, that. I do shoot people because I'm a photographer. Okay, so now <laughs> we, we've opened a can of worms, yes. We've opened yeah. a can and just skill after skill after skill is coming out. And where we started this conversation and where we ended up now, it's like two different people. Yeah. Uh, but it's not, it's the same person. It's the same person. Uh, I think uh, I, I never want to stop myself from doing anything. Um, if, I'm, if I like something, if, if I got like a hobby, and if I have like a passion into it, if I put my all hard work, then I believe I can make it work. I can make a living out of it. You know, uh, I, n I never thought in a million years that I'd be a photographer. No way. You know, but as a model, I always used to think how these photographers are shooting. What's behind the camera? You know, what, how, how do they blur the background? You know, where are these lighting, these compositions, these ISO, the shutter speed, the whole thing? Just to intrigue me. And people used to say to me, oh, Junaid, you're a model. Can you recommend some photographers? We got this wedding going on, or we got this work, we got this shoot. And I used to recommend other photographers. And I thought to myself, why? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm passionate about it. Why not try? So I start learning about cameras, about photography, and slowly, slowly started building from there, really, and la, alhamdulillah, got business. So, you talked about being successful, yeah? But a lot of times, especially the young people that I work with, they don't see anything but the end result. They see the total success at the end, but the, they don't see the hard work or the build-up or the number of times somebody falls over before they actually get to where they want to get to. Yeah. So, 
give us just a raw example of when something has gone wrong and Ooh. what you've done to put it right or what you haven't done to put it right and what the results were. Uh, there's been so many incidents, honestly, gen- just generally in life. So give us one highlight, one that stands out, like uh, a mad catastrophe. If I was reading a book and I thought, whoa, this guy really messed up. So for example, if I'm shooting, for example, your wedding, just imagine, I go home, <laughs> I open my bag, there's no camera. Because someone has stolen your camera with all the files, all the data in it. Let's not think about, first, let's not even think about how much that camera costed, yeah? Just think about what are you going to say to the bride and groom? Their big day. You cannot go back. Just imagine. Right? What did you do to put it right? I gave them all the money back. And I compensated them. Heavily? Uh, I was generously. Generously, yeah. But um, even then they said, we know it's not your fault and we appreciate you doing that. But then look, karma. I had a call four days later from the, the venue people. And they said, we've got the person who got your camera on CCTV. It was someone um, that I knew. We won't mention. Okay. Yeah, no. So, okay. So that's one, you basically lucky really because you did things properly. But just imagine if he would have formatted <laughs> the, uh, those memory cards. Just imagine. So in the end, did you get all the pictures done? Yes, I got the pictures at the end. And what did the couple say to you? They said, we want to pay you back. I said, just pay me the compensation back. This is a shock as it is. And for me to go through, I would just, you know, emotionally, I can't imagine what you guys are going through, you know. So as a goodwill, I said to them, don't worry about it. It was on me. Because, you know, in life, you're going to have so many downs. But... It's how you get up that makes you different. You know, a um, couple of years ago, I was uh, in a very bad state. I was uh, diagnosed with uh, high depression. Uh, and I tried to do something stupid. And. Uh, I think that's when I, uh, that's why I called uh, Sanan. I said, uh, no, I would like to join boxing. Because I didn't want to take the uh, medication, the prescribed medication, whatever they were giving me. I've got two kids and they look up to me and I want to give them my best. You know, in life, life will bring you down so bad, so, so bad, that you'll think there's no way out. But that's your thinking. Honestly, it's your thinking. Just close your eyes for literally 20 seconds and breathe. And that's what I did. And I think that's when I called Sinan. I said, um, You know, I wanted to know about boxing because I've never done boxing in my life. Um, The only time I used to take my anger is in a cricket field. When I got a ball, that's the only way I should take my anger out. You know, my granddad used to say to my dad, Mataya, he used to say, just be careful of him Uh, because everybody asks me, Oh, you never get angry. You never get angry. Why? I said, because I have no rights on you. I cannot be angry at you. And that's with everybody. I'm like that with no one. Not even my parents have seen my anger. Nobody. My sisters, my family, nobody has. Because I don't get angry. When I get my, 
I think my anger is my silence. I just go quiet and I go in a corner or alone. That's how I deal. You know, people, different people deal differently. But why I deal like this is a story. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I have any rights on anybody. You know, I, I got bullied. I've never punched anyone. I never hit anyone in school, in college. I remember here when I moved to Birmingham, um, there were a group of young lads uh, because I was good at, in sports. I was, you know, really good at cricket. I was very fast at running. I remember me being surrounded by 27 or 30 guys and I was the only person in the middle. I just took a breath. I just, I, I, I just took a breath and uh, that's it. And I, I looked down and they just started beating me up. I still remember that day. But nothing happened. I didn't want, if I wanted to, I could have fight, you know, landed a punch there and there. I said, no, I need to control my anger. Because, yes, they are hitting me. And what if something happens to me? It's on them. Fine. I don't care about that. But what if I hit someone so bad that they won't be able to function for the rest of their lives? Would you be able to live like that? I'm a little bit different, but oh, you're a you're no, a coach. <laughs> no, you know, with you, obviously, what I get, I get an aura of like there's a lot of wisdom behind what you're saying, and it mainly relates to your experiences. But me, I'm the kind of person I normally think after I've taken action, I'm like a, a bit of a loose cannon. I'll react, but then I'll regret. With you, I think you negate the regret altogether, and even if I don't agree with you with what your approach is, I respect your approach. And obviously you confide in that and that works for you. And obviously you shared a lot of things here that I wouldn't have understood unless you shared them. So my hat comes off to you, respects there. And the question you asked me, it doesn't really matter what I would do because it's about you. And you've told <laughs> us what you've done and what you do. You see, that's why, I mean, people that are listening out there, I don't want you to take this example of me. You know, I want you to Teach and learn yourself. What are you as a person, as an individual? I became like that because of my experiences. You know, maybe I wouldn't be like this if I didn't go through what I went through in life, you know? Um, but yeah, uh, anger, I think it's, if you can, please try to control. Not just with your fist. It, it, it could be with your mouth, with your tongue, you know? It, or oh, mentally, it doesn't have to be physically. We're just going to wrap up now. I want to ask you to give me one sentence of motivation. You can think for about three, four seconds. You know that four seconds at the end of the catwalk? Oi. You're at the end of the catwalk now. So okay. four seconds and tell me one sentence to motivate the people watching this. Uh, I'll say, remember every, every step that you take in life, it's towards something great. Uh, whether it's a step back or forward, no, if you take one step back, your next step will be two steps ahead. So don't give up. Don't give up on your dreams and don't give up on yourself. Self-respect and self-confidence. Get the truth before the truth gets you. Okay. <laughs>